CENTCOM. That is the U.S. Central Command. So they say, why is Clapper, who has 12 intelligence agencies uh, to uh, feed him stuff, why is he appealing to this brigadier general in uh, CENTCOM? Uh, good question. On the other hand, uh, what's going on here? And what I am thinking uh, is that this is somehow – an operation masterminded by Allen and by McGurk, and I'll tell you why. We're told that that Clapper has no business talking to this uh, this uh, brigadier general in the uh, CENTCOM, uh, but then in the course of this article in the Daily Beast, we then have this big tirade against General Lloyd Austin. Yeah, let's. We can give you a little bit more now. I finally found the uh, the document. So, it's the. Uh, I'm sorry. The the Guardian starts, and we'll have it in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's September 11th, uh, 2014. If you still haven't figured out what happened on September 11th, 2001. You have got to go to tarpley.net and click on my book. That is to say, 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA. And we are now up to 46 drills and other operations through which this event was conduited through the U.S. bureaucracy, since this is the way such things are done in the modern age. You take the drill live, you flip it live, you've got the patsies, the moles, and the technicians. You've got the angel is next. I am the only one who pays any attention to this vital evidence. That is why the fifth edition, make sure it's the fifth edition now, of 9-11 Synthetic Terror is, in my opinion, modesty apart. The, the most uh, complete and the most accurate story because it tells you pretty much how it was done. And within certain limits, it also tells you who did it. But now let's look. It's uh, The Guardian. Okay, The London Guardian here on uh, September 10th says that James Clapper is having frequent communication with a military official who is said to be implicated into a Pentagon inquiry of uh, concerning manipulated intelligence. So the idea is that Clapper is talking every day with the head of the U.S. Central Command Intelligence Wing, Army Brigadier General Stephen Grove, G-R-O-V-E, which is highly unusual. How dare you? Uh, this is the same Clapper who lied to Congress. Uh, one official says Clapper has to be careful of the Cheney effect. If he physically went and visited the CIA, that would cause a stir. How would that affect people? Uh, Clapper is, of course, an easy punching bag. He's manipulative, we're told. Uh, and so we have Grove, again, the Brigadier General, Stephen Grove, and his civilian deputy, Greg Reichman, R-Y-C-K-M-A-N. They are said to be the sources of dissatisfaction among analysts within Central Command, where an internal controversy about the integrity of their information and intelligence has now sparked an official inquiry by the Pentagon Inspector General. So a lot of this stuff is the, the, uh, the Daily Beast, as I said. Uh, the inquiry was uh, reported by the New York Times in August. Um, so the big problem is, where is Allen? Well, we're told some interesting things. Uh, according to The Guardian, quote, the command environment within Central Command is toxic. This is down in Tampa. This is where uh, Allen had been operating, and then he got ousted. Uh, and now the London Guardian targets General Lloyd Austin, the Central Command chief, He's uh, not really implicated in the intelligence manipulation, but according to a senior defense official, at the end of the day, he's responsible for his staff. Well, what is this? They want to show you that Austin is a bungler to the consternation of Senate Hawks. Austin has declined to permit U.S. troops in Iraq to spot for airstrikes, which inhibits their accuracy. I can't evaluate this, but 
It's building towards something very suspicious. Last year, Austin defended the wisdom of the U.S. Foking, focusing, uh, defended the Iraq first uh, strategy. Um, so why why target uh, General Austin? We've also got Marine General Vincent Stewart, the G the director of the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. He said on Thursday that the various investigations will play themselves out and see if anybody did anything wrong. Now, going back to that landmark series of exposés at the end of July, beginning of August, from the tax Wall Street Party uh, and yours truly, um, turns out one of the biggest bureaucratic enemies of Allen is this General Lloyd Austin who's being targeted. So you tell me, uh, not everybody was pleased when Allen became the ISIS czar. Among the dissenters was the head of U.S. Central Command, General Lloyd Austin. Austin complained to aides that Allen would report directly to the president, bypassing both himself and General Martin Dempsey. Uh-huh, what is this? Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Austin believes that Allen's appointment would lead to confusion about who was really leading the effort. A senior U.S. officer said, why the hell do we need a special envoy? Isn't, what, isn't that what the Secretary of State is for? Uh, Austin's private doubts have been shared by serving and retired officers. Included in this group was former U.S. Central Command Chief Anthony Zinni, not the worst guy, based on what you see on TV, who issued a harsh public condemnation of the appointment. John Allen is a great guy, said Zinni, damning with faint praise. Zinni told a reporter on September 12th last year, does it take a retired general to coordinate a coalition? What is CENTCOM? Chopped liver? Oh, boy. So it looks to me like Allen is attempting to muddy the waters, counterattacking through these articles that try to blame Clapper and Grove and perhaps Reichman for somehow skewing the intelligence, whereas you just take the, take the obvious thing. How was the intelligence skewed? It's generally skewed into triumphalism. Why? To protect the phony war strategy of appeasement uh, advocated by Allen and McGurk to make it look like their method was winning, because if it's losing, then there's going to be pressure to uh, to uh, to change the strategy. So this was a smokescreen. And Alan, as we said before, is still operating with these smoke screens. He's going from we're winning to it's going to take forever uh, and so forth. McGurk in the same boat. The answer is fire Alan for ISIS. Hashtag fire Alan for ISIS. Uh, we're getting now with the cooking of the books. Michael Morell, former head of the CIA, said that that is an offense for which you can go to jail. So maybe we better lift and shift into arrest Allen for ISIS. We'll take a look at that if this goes any, uh, any further. So there it is. Uh, Allen has plenty of bureaucratic enemies. Why don't they come forward? Uh, we have General Conway made a name for himself in Iraq. John Allen is taking a lot of credit for work done by others. I was in those meetings. I don't remember seeing him. <laughs> That's in a book called uh, Mark Perry. Is John Allen in over his head? So the ISIS are under fire. Answer, get him out. Fire him. So uh, that is the uh, the state of the Washington bureaucratic uh, warfare here uh, in the week after Labor Day. And we'll be right back on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now we want to turn to our ongoing feature, which I think is going to keep us busy for a number of weeks to come. And that is to say our major uh, inquiry into the area of COINTELPRO, and in particular, the changes in COINTELPRO that have been institutionalized after 9-11, that is to say in the last 14 years, and in particular, even within that time frame, since about 2006, 7, 8, when the social media, in particular Twitter and Facebook, uh, came into view. So the, the word to uh, the 9-11 
question is, si monumentum requires circumspice. If you're looking for a monument, look around you. It's everywhere. A society honeycombed by spies, informers, provocateurs, or informal uh, colleagues, as the Stasi would say, right? Informella Mitarbeiter, informal uh, helpers. Now, we've got a, uh, a new uh, situation, and it is shocking. COINTELPRO was uh, thoroughly uh, vetted, was thoroughly exposed in 1971 and in those years, in particular then in the uh, post-Watergate years, 74, 75, uh, and thereabouts, um, by the Church Committee, Senator Frank Church of Idaho in the Senate, and by Congressman Otis Pike in the House of Representatives. So we were we were familiarized with COINTELPRO, which was the FBI code term for counterintelligence and provocation. It was ways to make life difficult for the peace movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, similar movements, civil rights movement, they did it, and they tried to harass them, Martin Luther King, his groups, uh, and also student movement, right? People who were interested in uh, SDS and so forth, and uh, these, these domestic uh, counterintelligence, counterinsurgency operations, I think, uh, went very far. Uh, it was in this uh, time that we began to see, in my own experience, the concepts of the NAG network, uh, and in particular, the, the application of this principle of the counter gang. In other words, if you want to contain and sabotage a political cause, a political operation, you create something which vaguely resembles it without, of course, the the main programmatic points, without the soul, if you will, uh, and then uh, let that um, fester and use that to, uh, to undermine the authentic uh, group, because the bet is always that people are not paying enough attention to really be able to discern the difference between the real thing and the FBI uh, substitute. So uh, let's just look at a little bit of the history of this. Um, we uh, we will get on to, uh, to to more specifics both this week and uh, next week. And now let's look at where it comes from. The interesting thing here is that uh, the the new phase of CoinTelPro, we can call it. COINTELPRO 2.0, uh, in, in this context, the COINTELPRO 1.0 would have been the COINTELPRO of the 1960s and 70s in particular, investigated by Church and Pike, uh, which never completely went away. But then, uh, after, uh, well, after 9-11, it was brought back uh, with a vengeance. Now, the model that was studied, interestingly enough, is the model of the Stasi. Uh, people know this as S-T-A-S-I. It means Ministry for State Security, Ministerium für Staatssicherheit of the now defunct German Democratic Republic. In other words, Communist East Germany, known also as Pankow after the part of East Berlin where the main government buildings were uh, located. This Pankow regime uh, was, of course, a very thorough police state. And uh, I've had plenty of occasion to talk to people uh, who have been there. I sort of, you know, strolled through it once a time myself. And I, was, I think somebody told me I'd been been observed, right, that I had been filmed. Um, but that's this is what they did. So they had a very pervasive secret police, and this is the Stasi, um, or sometimes known as Das Organ, the uh, the organ, <laughs> Stasi Staatssicherheitsdienst, State Security Service. That's the FBI. Uh, the head of it was uh, a murderer, a guy who had actually committed murders in the Weimar Republic in the 1930s, right before Hitler. This was Erich Mielke. So the, the joke in those days was that the East Germans, that was the land of Mielke and Honey. Mielke at the state security and Erich Honecker, the two Erichs, Mielke and Honecker. That was, that was, that was the, uh, the dictatorship the dictatorship running East Germany. Now, here's their problem. Before about 1975, the DDR, 
uh, operated East Germany operated or the East the Ostzone right as Adenauer would call it the Eastern Zone. Uh, they operated.